of, that we apply in conferences like this is we take just one offering. In other words, each person prays to God and asks God, what should I give? Okay? An offering is a sacred thing. And I don't think we should just make it a ritual that every time you just pass the offering basket around. So you pray to God, whatever God lays in your heart. And the offering day will be Saturday evening, all right, is when we take one offering according to what God has laid in your heart to give, okay? Saturday evening, and we repeat it on Sunday. When we say Sunday as a reminder, but if you have given on Saturday, you don't give again on Sunday. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Uh -huh. So it's one offering. Don't give above what God says you should give. It is disobedience. So, do you hear what I said here? Uh -huh. If it says this is what you should give, it's what you should give. You don't give above or beneath. You give exactly what God said you should do what you should give. So on the set day will be Saturday evening when we will take um, the offering. All right. Our second speaker for this morning. All right. She's now part and parcel. Okay. Look, let me, let me, I mean, I, I don't want to be this, but how do I say this now? You know, you almost have to struggle now to find ministers that are just pure word-centered ministers. You almost have to struggle now to do it. You, you are going around and, and doing all of that. And... Okay, I won't say this one. All right. But, I mean, so when you find people like that, it is a joy and delight in your heart that you have people that have stuck with the word of God, that are staying with the word of God, that are, I mean, what we just heard now, those are the things that are responsible for everything we have going on in the country today. All right? Those fundamental truths is what people came to understand, what people came to apply within their lives that has brought about, all right, these um, expressions that we have all over. And um, in, in fact, I, I repented recently, and I, I will say what I repented of, and I will use Kenneth Hagin as a cover for my repentance. In the sense, I will say it this way, in a sense that when you started having camp meetings, and you have to be careful when God gives you a vision. If you leave a vision to itself, it will go into excesses. If you leave a vision to itself, you, the natural tendencies, you will begin to go off tangents. That's why Jesus said, any branch in me that bears fruit, he prunes it. Because if not, it can start going off. And he said once, I think it was in 1987 in camp meeting, he said, God told me, have camp meetings, do this. He said... Morning sessions, afternoon sessions, I believe, uh, teach on the subject of faith. Evening sessions, he said, have Holy Ghost meetings. He then said, we began to invite people that understood faith, but people were no longer teaching on that subject of faith. So he said, God corrected him on that, and that he came back and told the ministers, he said, look, go back. So when I was preparing for this meeting, God said, look, my friend, this meeting is a word of faith meeting. So put in the thing that is clear. The faith that does what? Moves mountains. All right? And go back to that core teaching of the faith message there as the thrust, all right, of the meeting there. So we did that. And I'm sure you have seen in these sessions that we have done that the anointing in this conference is at a very, very high level. All right? That people can have practical things they can hold on to go and practice after the meeting and do that. And so that's what this conference is about. And if I derail again, pray to God eh, that you should bring me back again to the things that are faith be I I've told you uh -huh, because the tendency is just say, okay, let's just go with the flow, but you stay all right with that. And there's a minister, she's been true to it. I went to preach for her in our church. That church is a spiritual church. Uh, Capitals Church is a spiritual church. If you were on campus back then, you know how concentrated worship are. Uh -huh. The worship there is con the pure form of psalm, hymns, and spiritual songs. 
real deal that you can touch there. And it takes a person of character, it takes a person of integrity, and it takes an authentic person to be able to grow that kind of church and ministry uh, today within this country. Let us welcome to the podium Pastor Enkechi Ene, the senior pastor of Carpenter's Church. When I was here last, it was Wafbeck. <laughs> but now we are Wafbeck. Hello, Wafbeck. <laughs> it's so good to be back. I almost feel like saying back home. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Koju. Thank you, Pastor Tui, for this wonderful privilege. I don't take it for granted. I'm really excited to be here. Amen. And I believe God has a word for you today this evening and tomorrow morning when I'll be privileged to minister. I've heard the sessions so far, some of them, they have just been amazing. You all are going to be overfed by the time Wolfbeck is over, amen. I bring greetings from my people in Potaikot. My special Potaikot people who are all online, we say hello. My husband, and Mecca says hello, aw, really aw. <laughs> <laughs> Your husband is 31 years with you, and he's such a support. You say, oh, when you call his name. <laughs> so to my husband, um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> my associate pastor, Pastor Shola, sends his love. My daughters are here. <laughs> Zoe, Enne, Chloe, Enne. My other daughter who asks as my PA is here, Osinachi, and her son, my grandson, Zini, is somewhere in the congregation with his auntie. So I came with a big group from Port Harcourt. Amen. Please sit down. Remember what are the two things I don't preach without? All right, you don't remember, eh? A smile. A smile, a smile, I won't continue. <laughs> There's no rhema behind this one, just a simple smile, a smile, and a response. So let's practice, a smile, and a response. You're ready for the word. And what is the one thing I don't play with? My time. So I've seen that introduction now, it's taking two minutes. So I will cut that part, and I will add two minutes after my message. <laughs> because I didn't come here to do introduction, I came here to preach. Amen. Amen. You know this theme, um, faith that moves mountains, living, um, doing the impossible. You, you hear that kind of theme and you wonder, um, the person that put up that theme must know something. Why do I say that? If you look for the meaning of the word impossible, impossible means something that is not able to occur. Not able to occur. Not able to exist. Not able to be done. And then you, you put up a conference and you call it doing the impossible. It's either you've got a mental problem, which I don't believe Pastor Bush has, <laughs> Or there's something you know. Something that is not able to occur, not able to exist, not able to be done. You say, let us gather and learn how we will do it. It's doable. Amen. Today's message is titled, Living in the Possible Zone. Living in the Possible Zone. A zone is an area or a stretch of land, or a, 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 a zone, really. Something that has a particular purpose or characteristic. 
So living in an area, living in a zone, living in a sphere where it's only possible. So what is it that Pastor Bodju knows to gather us here to tell us that we can do what is not able to be done and we can do what is not able to occur or to exist? I believe three foundational things we need to establish. Just set it. It's number one, God doesn't deal with the word impossible. He doesn't know that word. So if there's a dictionary that God uses and you open it up and look inside, you won't find the word impossible. The Bible says in Mark chapter 10, it says, not with God. With men it is impossible, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. That's one thing he knows, that God doesn't deal with that word. The second thing he knows is that in Jesus Christ, God has opened up a portal for some people to also not deal with that word. God doesn't deal with that word. With men, things are impossible, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. God didn't live with himself. In Christ Jesus, he opened up a portal and let some men in who also like him. Mark chapter 9 says, all things are possible to those men. Who are the men? Men who believe. And the third thing he knows is that the tool those men use to move from impossible to possible is a tool called faith. That is why this theme is a combined theme. Faith that moves mountains doing the impossible. Every situation you face in your life is going to be either in the possible zone or the impossible zone. Everything is either happening in the impossible zone or it's happening in the possible zone. The impossible zone is open to both the believer and the unbeliever. The possible zone is the right and privilege of the believer. The impossible zone is open to both the believer and the unbeliever. But the possible zone is the right and privilege of the believer. Because your father doesn't deal with that word. At the end of this conference, impossible will be placed where it should be placed in your life. And you will understand how you can live and function with all this collection of ministers in the possible zone. Glory be to God. So we're going to be taking a case study today of Jesus and his disciples as they do the impossible. There are so many stories we could have taught from. And I know the Holy Spirit is going to stretch out these stories across all the great men of God he's got here at this conference. But today we're going to look at the story of how Jesus fed the 5,000. That story is found in all the Gospels. John chapter 6, Matthew 14, Mark 6, and Luke 9. I'm going to be reading from John chapter 6, that version. We'll pick a few things from the other, um, other renditions, but I'll take it from John 6. Are you with me? Just testing the response. I'll soon test the smile. Okay, just did that, all right. John 6, from verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? 
But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who's got five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. In verse 5, we see something there. It says, a great multitude, everybody say great multitude, followed him. That was verse 2. Verse 5, then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude. There are many words in the Greek you can use for see. The particular word used there is a word that means listen. It means to contemplate something, listen, and to have careful and deliberate vision which interprets its object. So what you see, you understand what it, what it actually is. That's the word used there. It says he saw a great multitude. That together is the, are the words polus oculus. Everybody say polus oculus. Say polus oculus. A great multitude. Something remarkable, something big in magnitude, listen. A moving crowd or mod, a, thong, a throng, something large in degree. A polus oculus there describes a mountain. And the Bible says it was moving towards him. And he theomied it. He saw it and understood what it was. There was a polus oculus coming towards him, a great multitude. What is the polus oculus facing you right now? There is a multitude. Everybody has got a polus oculus of some sort coming towards them. Jesus lifted up his eyes and he saw the mountain. And the Bible says it was coming towards him. So he was responsible to solve that problem. And since he theomied it, he understood what he was seeing. He understood that this was a need of very hungry people coming towards him in large quantities. He also understood that he was responsible to take care of it. What polus oculus are you responsible for right now? What great multitude, what mountain is staring at you? It's not broken in its focus. It's coming for you because you are responsible. Nobody else is going to take that responsibility for you. What then do you do? That's a case of the impossible. He registered their number. He knew they were coming for him. He had to solve the problem. Well, let's establish one thing before we get into it, which is very important. That's really for number one. Something you must realize is that when these mountains come for you, they don't choose a convenient time. They don't say, okay, so um, at this time now, Pastor Boji is ready for this mountain. Let us now hit him with it. Mm -mm. Do you know what had just happened before this? If you read several of the Gospels, just before this, just before this, the verse before this, Jesus had just heard that John had been beheaded. Do you know who John was to him? In the least, he was his cousin. He was the one who announced his ministry, more importantly. He was like a spiritual mentor to him. 
He was the one who baptized him. John meant a lot to him and was cruelly and unnecessarily killed. It affected Jesus. The Bible says when he heard it, he departed to a deserted place. To be. He just, just left. Listen to me. Even when you are emotionally exhausted, mountains will come for you. Even when you are emotionally exhausted, mountains will come for you. In the 33, I believe we are now, years of ministry, in the carpenter's ministry, probably the most traumatic, most difficult, most high intensity pressure periods we ever faced were in the years 2013 to 2014, 15. And actually it wasn't fair because 2013 was when our founding pastor went to be with the Lord. God should have understood now. Should have understood. Didn't he know how traumatized I was, we were? Taking over a church he didn't plan for. But that was when, I can't remember in all the ups and downs of ministry ever been under as much polus oculus as that period. Mountains don't respect your time zone. They don't. These children here, my children, they, they had their high school in the US. To particularly the second one, you play here, and I will use you as an example here today. <laughs> when I don't enter here. You say, you want to follow me, go walk back. You know, don't follow me. This one here. She's, she doesn't respect my time zone. Imagine, even now she's an adult working in California. California time, nine hours. Hello, mom. Uh, yeah. Yes, darling. Why? Can't you see I'm sleeping? No, mom, your work is my mom. So anytime I call you, you just answer me. I don't, there's no, I don't know your time. Know my time. OK, good night. You know, don't say good night. It's good afternoon. She's like a mountain. Mountains don't respect your time zone. So one of the first things you should just not bother doing with God is it's not fair. The only thing you are legitimately allowed to tell God is not fair over your life is his favor. You'll get that tomorrow. The only thing you are legitimately allowed to tell God over your life is not fair. Is his favor. But don't go moaning at any mountain. Mountains don't respect your time zone. Jesus was emotionally exhausted. He was also physically exhausted. The Bible says he went to rest. It says he went and sat down. If you study those words, because of time, I won't go into them. They literally mean rest, sat down, somebody physically exhausted. But the Bible also says, as the multitudes came towards him, he was moved with compassion, and he got up and began to minister to them. He forgot immediately. Any minister here worth their anointing will tell you that you must disregard your feelings many times in order to face those mountains. The church has become too feelings conscious. And that's what has affected faith. Many things have affected faith. I heard some great things, Pastor Boj, you said yesterday morning. I was watching online. And I believe this conference will align a lot of things back to where they should be, where God expects them to be. So we don't keep reading about testimonies of old as if those testimonies have expired. It gets greater and better with God. But what has corrupted it is feelings. How you feel, your emotions, how they looked at you, what, that's complete nonsense. It means nothing to God. He was emotionally exhausted. He was physically exhausted. But the polus oculus came towards him. He couldn't delegate it towards him. If you will be a faith warrior and a faith champion, put your emotions where they should be. They're just spice. They're not the main meal. Nobody takes a bowl of salt and eats it. 
You have to have the rice, and then you sprinkle it with salt. Amen. So the first thing I told you was what? Recognize that impossible tasks and faith challenges come even when you are exhausted. Even when you are exhausted. A lot of work has gone into putting Wolf back together. A lot of the volunteers have worked so hard, I can only imagine. After Wolf Beck, you deserve to just have a mountain free rest. <laughs> you may not. You may not. Polus Oculus does not know how you feel. Glory be to God. Let's look at the next thing. Back to John 6, chapter 6. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing, and seeing a great multitude coming towards him. Now, watch this. He said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Why do people ask questions? They want answers, right? So the question, where shall we buy bread that these may eat, means he was asking where they should buy bread so they will eat. That's normal, right? Okay. But the next line says, but this he said to test him, for he himself knew what to do. So why did he ask the question? He knew what to do, but he was asking if they should buy bread that they may eat. Friends, that was a trick question. God doesn't ask you any question because he needs help. So you, see, you, you too, where you are, you begin to advise God where you should buy bread. <laughs> you might think about it. First of all, even naturally, that word buy is a word agorazo that comes from agora, marketplace. They were at the top of the mountain. Spa and ShopRite had not reached there. <laughs> they were at the top of the mountain. There was no marketplace nearby. So what was Jesus really asking? Some scholars tell you he was asking Philip because Philip came from Bethsaida, which wasn't too far away. So Philip would go to his hometown and buy bread, hello. So from the mountain, he would travel to his hometown. How much bread will he carry for 5,000 uh, 5, men? They were wives and children. So maybe minimum 20,000. If they were Africans, like 30, 35. Because we used to bomb plenty. <laughs> so how will he carry that? So there's no way, even normally, Jesus could have expected an answer to that question. So why did he ask? The Bible says he, that he may test him. If you look at that word very well, it shows you what teachers do with their questions. Hey. Teachers don't ask you questions because they don't, they don't know the answer. The teachers have the answer scripts. They're not asking you so that when you now intelligently with your brain give them the answer. The teacher will now say, hey, what a smart student. I didn't know that was the answer. The teacher wants to know what you do. Jesus simply wanted to know what he was seeing. When the polus oculus comes against you, what do you see? It is what you see. Listen, I'm going to make it as simple as possible. It is what you see that determines where you will go for the answer. If you don't identify the problem, you will not know where to find the answer. Now get this. Every polus oculus that comes against you has one thing is demanding from you, faith. It's a faith demand. It may come looking like a financial demand. It may come looking like a health demand. It may come looking like some other kind of demand. It's not that. It's a faith demand. E.g., you have a need. You need to pay your rent. Your rent is due. It's 200,000 naira. It is not 
a financial demand facing you. If you think that is what it is, you will start looking for how to raise that nasty word we've adopted as Christians, raise, how to raise and resurrect 2,000 naira, 200,000 naira. Therefore, you will look and target the rich brothers in church. You don't do that in this church. There's no, nobody here does it. This church is past that level. Be deceiving yourself. <laughs> you will target the rich brothers in church because you think, you think it's a financial problem. So you need the rich people that will solve it financially. It's not that. Jesus needed to know what was Philip seeing with that crowd coming towards him. When you have a polus oculus in your body, a polus oculus in your finances, a polus oculus in your relationship, what is God actually expecting you to see? What you see is where you will look for your answers. And imagine if your answer is here, and you're spending all your energy looking here. Will the problem go away? Will the mountain move? No. So there was an impossibility here. Something serious was facing Jesus. And he asked a trick question because he already knew what he would do. Glory be to God. He needed to know what Philip and the rest understood of the situation. Write this down. If you're a child of God and any task comes to you, it makes a faith demand on you. It makes a faith demand on you. Therefore, you cannot, you cannot afford the luxury of being devoid of faith. I'll say it again. If you're a child of God and any task, any mountain comes towards you, it makes a faith demand on you. You cannot afford the luxury of being devoid of faith, of being bankrupt of faith, or you will never, you will never dissolve the impossibilities. Faith is a currency that solves every problem. Every problem. Faith is the currency you need. Okay? So let's, let's move on. What happens next? What have I told you so far? You know, I like, I like giving you points for you, Ghana, and nothing. What is the first thing I said? What did I say? Eh. Recognize that impossible tasks and faith challenges come even when you feel exhausted, okay? Number two, did I give you number two? Okay, realize that Jesus already has the answer, but he needs you to trigger it. Then write this down. Number three, remember, everybody say remember, that faith is a spiritual force. This next point will show you where a lot of us miss it. Faith is a spiritual force. So natural reasoning will not pull any triggers. Faith is a spiritual force. So natural reasoning will not pull any triggers. Let's go back to the question that Jesus asked. Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? So what is Jesus doing? Please follow me carefully. Here is Jesus with this big mountain before him. And he knew what to do. We know the end of this story. What is the end? How did he feed them? Huh? He broke five loaves and two fish. Remember that. So we're starting from the end. We know it. He knew what to do. And thank God we're reading it. We know what he did. So what he did had nothing to do with buying bread. So if he knew what he would do, 
And if asked about buying bread, that was a trick question, right? He now presents that question to them. What does he want? He wants to raise his team to learn how to function. A good leader always does that. He could have just done what he needed to do and cut short the whole thing. Sometimes to grow a team, things take longer. And for some of us who feel very organized, it can be quite painful sometimes. So we end up overworking ourselves, trying to do it ourselves. But a good leader must learn to delegate. But delegating slows you down. Delegating, you get some gaps, like we're about to see. We're going to see the patience of leadership in what Jesus did. Remember, he knew what to do. He could have solved this problem like that and moved on with his ministry. But then you move on with dead load. You wouldn't have raised anybody. And you are the super Mr. Efficient, Miss Efficient, all sorts of game, nobody else. If you're not there, the ministry collapses. That's not how to be a leader. That's not leadership. But what did he do? The man knew what to do. So, Philip, where, where, where can we buy bread? I mean, they had just come from seeing Jesus performing many miracles. Philip could have said, buy bread. Master, is it not you? If it's stone, I bring it now. But anything you want to do, just tell us. We're at your service. That would have been closer to the truth. But he wanted them to pull the right trigger. We're going to see the first trigger Philip pulled which did not shoot the gun, was a logical trigger. Everybody write down logical trigger. If you pull a logical trigger, you will never dissolve any impossibilities. And what was the logical trigger? As Jesus asked that question, Philip's maths brain, like the one I used to have, locked into gear. Master, 5,000 times four, 20,000. One bread costs 50 naira. 50 naira, one bread times 20,000. You know, we, we, sometimes we pastors, we can calculate to 50,000. <clears throat> Divide by one denaira. <laughs> Jesus, in case your mass is feeling you, 200 denaira will not even buy enough for them to have a little each. And that translation says eight months' salary. That shows you how he did the maths. Eight months, that's what 200 denarii was. It was about eight months, because a denarii a, denari a day. I can't remember the translation that says about eight months' salary. Even if he worked for eight months, it won't be. Can you, can you? This is Jesus. Who knew what to do? Philip was advising him in mathematics. <laughs> so I think I've been in heaven for too long. <laughs> Let me advise you here on earth, when we did the mass, it doesn't used to add up, eh? Try another thing. That's what's holding you back. You're doing the maths. You're watching the clock in your body. You're watching the clock. You're checking the math of your degree. Apply for that job. I made a third class. The Spirit is prompting you, apply for that job. But I made a first class. Hello, Holy Spirit. It's a third class. Apply for that job. It's like you don't know how, you don't know how things work on this earth. That company does not take third class. I'm telling you. It doesn't sound familiar to anybody. Nobody does that. You see, logical triggers will never dissolve impossibilities. I had to learn that. Because my, this is my brain. That was a gift before I got called. Ah, A1, A1, by A1, 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 first class engineering, brain feeling very brainiac. But that brainiacness will just stop you from flowing in the spirit. And I thank God every day for my father in the Lord. Pastor Charles helped me crush that brain. And I used to tease him, I said, because he don't know maths. He says, it's better for me, I don't know maths. 
Because I know spirit. I now began to find out that knowing spirit was better than knowing mass. <laughs> so the days of mass, I put it aside. And now I know spirit. I dance with the Holy Spirit. You can't dance with the Holy Spirit logically. Sometimes you dance off beat. But it's his dance. So Philip was there calculating. Eight months salary. Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and say logical triggers. Will not, will not overcome an impossibility. Because what you end up with is what Philip ended up with. He calls not possible. He stayed in the impossible zone. Lack and, if, lack and insufficiency will not solve the problem. So Jesus moved on to plan B or to next question or to next issue. Look at what he now said. Before Jesus even spoke, after Philip hit him with the math equation, Philip now moved to the next trigger. Watch this. Let's go to Matthew this time, Matthew 14. When it was evening, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place. The hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. What was he doing here? What trigger was he pulling? He was pulling an emotional trigger. He was simply dodging his faith responsibility and making it look like he cared. He knew knew what was coming next. Because by Jesus asking him that question directly, Philip, where can we buy bread to feed these people? He did the math. It won't add up. I said... Jesus, you know what? See, the time has gone. Eh? Let them just be going to help themselves. See, they're tired. You are the one to take care of them, but you are dodging it. You can't dodge around the mountain. Jesus didn't ask you if you have faith, dodge the mountain. He didn't say that. Speak to it, deal with it, dissolve it. Crush it, don't touch it. And that's what he was doing. How do we dodge the mountain? I didn't cause the problem. It's not my fault. It, it happened before I got here. It was those people that did it. It's not in my department. It's not in my group. It may be in the same church. It's not in my side of the family. It's not in my area of work. But it's an opportunity for you to move that mountain and God will elevate you in it. But you don't see it. That trigger does not dissolve it. The next thing Jesus said to him was, you, you give them something to eat. Jesus knew exactly what they were doing, that they were dodging. He said, no, no, no. You, you, it is your responsibility. Bear in mind through this story that Jesus knew the end. They've told us from the beginning, Jesus knew what he would do. So he's going through this patient, tortuous approach to raise them to a point because he was, imagine three years on earth. That's all the time he had. He knew what he had to do to get them ready to be able to work with the Alice Paracletos. He knew that. He was getting them ready. This had a role. No, so you, you are the one, Philip. Don't be pretending like you care about them. Let them go. You give them something to eat. Turn to someone and tell them, you give point. I allow you to point today. Point. You give them something to eat. (laughs) Tell them you have more faith than you realize. You've got more faith on the inside of you than you know. Rise up and use it. 
You give them something to eat. You dissolve the impossibility. You drive the polos oculus. Glory be to God. So, it's your responsibility, not God's. I'll say that three times. See, to pass through spirit, soul, and body. It is your responsibility, not God's. It is your responsibility, not God's. It is your responsibility, not God's. Faith is believing what God has done, not what God will do. Faith is believing what God has already done. And then you step into it, not what God will do. It's a logical answer didn't solve the problem. An emotional answer didn't solve the problem. Instead, he got Jesus to tell him directly, it's your responsibility. So now, let's pause for a minute, friends, and put yourself in Philip's shoes. How do you think he now felt? First of all, his mats had fallen down. Then he tried to push it away. Jesus pushed it back. How do you think he now feels? Do you think he now goes, oh, Jesus, thank you for opening my eyes to see that it's now my responsibility. I'm ready now, Lord. What do you think he did? What do you think? What do you, my time is going. I my mind was the time for you. Not answering answer my question. <laughs> yeah, they talk one minute, answering one question. What is that? <laughs> I'm like, Jesus, I have the patience to, to test you in the question. <laughs> no, but, no, but honestly, what do you think his reaction was? Pressure. Huh? pressure. pressure. Did you say pressure? pressure? Depression. Okay, not quite depression, but someone said anger. You're getting close. Fear. Frustration is a word I want. Surprise. It was what? Anxiety. Anxiety. Yeah, getting close. It's a, it's, 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 how do you think he felt? Listen, you give them something to eat. Meanwhile, he had just been caught trying to dodge that responsibility. If I now do Bill Wilson's time, I bring out $1 now, $100, the answer will not come out. I will bring 100 naira. The $100, that's how I get the flu now. I'm not bringing it, that's how I mean. <laughs> Friends, yeah, you're all not wrong. The word I'm looking for. <laughs> okay, pause, 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 pause. Do you think, do you think by Jesus telling him, you give them something to eat, he felt accused? And if he felt accused, what do you think his next response would be? Defensive. Defensive. He said defending himself. He literally, listen, he literally had been caught pants down. Time is gone, it's late. Let them go and find themselves something to eat, Lord. Let's help them. So say, come, my friend. Now you get this work, you. He began to defend himself immediately. And look at what he said. Let's go to Luke 9. Luke 9, verse 13. To Jesus is still trying to get them to pull the right trigger. Verse 13, until you pull the right trigger, that impossibility will not go away. Luke 9, 13. He said to them, you give them something to eat. Look at this. And they said, we have no more. They went back to the man. 
no more than, listen, five loaves and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all these people. You put it like this, it sounds normal. This is an aggressive, sarcastic, defensive response. He literally was saying, Shebi, you have not heard that. We cannot buy food. Okay. It's only this Kwekere, five loaves and two fish here. Tell me how you want to do this one now. Abi, you want us to go and buy food from the market. Okay, it's my responsibility. Tell us what we will now do now. If you get into that realm, faith has left you. The mountain has taken root. You get defensive with God. Once you begin to find yourself reacting like that, you have stopped relying on grace. You don't feel it, you are the one doing it. And you are feeling the pressure. Because you are feeling that pressure, you begin to fight back. And God, he must be a dummy. Look at his answer. How can he be telling Jesus at this point? What an insult. At this point, unless you want us to go and buy food. So we can translate their aggressive response like this. Listen to this. All we have is five loaves and two fish. Okay, so should we go and buy bread? Or do you want to manufacture a supermarket in this desert? Will you give us money to buy the food? What should we do? Okay, it's our responsibility. How do we do it now? Please, we have reached our limit. We told you before to send these people away. You will not. Okay, it's our responsibility. Oh yeah, now, how are we going to do it? What impossible thing do you expect us to do next? They got so defensive, they were missing their answer right before them. Faith is never meant to accuse you. A faith demand or a faith burden is never meant to accuse you. If that demand is coming from God, it's not meant to accuse you. The minute you find yourself getting defensive, getting antsy about it, something is off. Either it was never God or you are not in the right place to receive it. And at this point, Jesus could have, I may even have vexed. I said, I beg, I know what to do. You all are wasting my time. But he didn't do that. He didn't do that. So a logical answer didn't solve it. An emotional answer didn't solve it. Friends, a defensive answer didn't solve it. John chapter 6, verse 8. Then one of his disciples, Andrew, watch this now. Watch how you can miss the trigger right before you because your mind is already all messed up where their minds were. Look at, look at this. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, listen, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. We know the end of the story. Did that statement have anything to do with the end of the story? Huh? Was that not the answer right there? Five barley loaves and two small fish. If they were looking, listen, listen, oh. If they knew it was a faith demand, when Jesus said, you give them something to eat, that would have been a remark word for them. They would have known, yes, we have to act on something here. But they didn't, they didn't hear it. Then the answer literally came to them. There's a guy here with five barley loaves and two small fish. Oh, yeah, now pull the trigger. Take it. You give them something to eat. Explosion. Miracle happens. They looked at it. And they killed it again. But what are they among so many? They went back to the math. Think of the patience of Jesus through all this. Even you said, you're beginning to feel now for this blue. Don't say that so you're like that before. Before now you are like that. Not anymore. Not anymore, Abby. We have moved. So don't, don't judge them. But imagine how Jesus felt. A lad here has five loaves and two fish. 
You give them something to eat. You've been working with me. You've been with me. You know what I can do. Oh, yeah, now move. But what are they among so many? But the exchange rate is so and so. But, but, Jesus wanted them to pull the right trigger. What was the right trigger? What was this trigger? What was this trigger? Release the answer Jesus has for you by pulling the trigger in the spiritual realm. This trigger we're about to find now had nothing to do with their logic, had nothing to do with their emotions, had nothing to do with their getting defensive or going back to their logic. No. If they were thinking right, they would have recognized what was right before them. The trigger you must begin to understand, friends, is the trigger of the faithfulness of God in your life. I'll explain what I mean. Everybody here can look back and remember at least one time God came through for you. Everybody here can remember at least one time a polus oculus was dissolved in your life. Everybody. If you can't remember and you are born again, that was one. Do you know the police Oculus facing you as an unbeliever? And you met Jesus and you became born again? One time at least. Jesus simply wanted them to begin to apply the principles they had seen and heard him do. There are some basic principles you must apply or you should apply when you are faced with a polus oculus. One of the first ones is the seed principle. The five loaves and two fish were seed, but they scorned it. What are they among so many? The power in your seed has not yet fully been understood. Even science has not. What is packed in a seed? And because the seed principle or the seed sowing has been so abused in the body of Christ, one of the struggles I, Pastor Boji was talking about repenting, it's like the season of repentance, because even me, I've been repenting of some things. One of the things I've been repenting of is when God tells me to do something. I don't disobey God. I don't know how to. But when he tells me to do something in an area that has been abused, it's such a struggle for me. I know the voice of God. I know when God speaks to me. Then he will tell me something to do that 10 other people are doing, and you're realizing the principle. And if I do this, I will look like them. I say, I'm not doing. Lord, you know, the and say, Lord, you know, I don't disobey. I don't disobey you, but this is how I cannot do it. They will think I've become like them. Lord, please preserve me my purity. Even your purity now becomes pride. God said you should do it because it has been abused. The seed principle, you can't play with it. The way mountains move by yielding to this principle has not yet fully been discovered. And there were five loaves and two fish. And they asked the question that killed it. What are there among so many? How many times has God shown you your seed? And you say, what is it among so much? You calculated how five loaves and two fish. We have a huge project going on in church. One day in a prayer meeting, the Lord spoke through one of the brothers in church. And he said, I'm not asking you to pay for this thing. Almost like, who do, you, who do you think you are that you can pay for it? I'm only asking you to believe for it. I will pay for it, God said. You just believe me for it. That's why a student can give 15 naira 
to a billion dollar project and not ask the question, what is this I want so much? Because that student has come to understand the seed principle. So there was the barley and the flows and the fish, and they disdained it. Friends, don't disdain your seed. Look back and think of how God has worked in your life and the faithfulness of God in your life. There are certain fail-proof principles that work with God. I remember when my first daughter was born, Zoe. We literally trekked to America to burn her. You know when you're literally trekking? Because you have counted your money. 1990-something. We now trekked. My husband couldn't even come with me because there was only one ticket we could buy. And he insisted I had to have a baby in America. I said, let us just burn this child here. Let's burn this child here. He took me to Pastor Charles and reported me, and I was instructed to obey my husband to submit. So I submitted and trekked to America. <laughs> and he could not trek with me. So we now got there. I got there rather. I had the baby before he could come. That year, we only had one job. You know, our company had just started. The company was five years old then. One or two jobs. It was hard. So what we did, because we had estimated just off head, maybe the, the bill then would cost, because we, we, we didn't want to owe like $2,500 or something. We thought that we aimed for around that. So we counted $250 and sold it into a man of God's life before we left. And he prayed with us and we thanked him and we left. We arrived in America, I bond, that was another story. Two days of labor, finally she agreed to come out. <laughs> I'll go use that for this conference. Eh? <laughs> I eventually bond, that's another story. After I bond her, <laughs> I was now waiting for the bill. You know when you are believing God, you are thinking I create this motion. Two five. Two five, two five, two five, Lord, two five. They now brought the bill. Hey, hey, five thousand dollars. I said, Jesus. I will sell my baby today in this America. <laughs> I will wash plates. Five thousand dollars. I say it is way. So I, I did my shoulder like this. I say, Lord, bear in mind I was still alone. I got had no threat to come. So I now took the bill and I went through it line by line, as if I knew what I was looking for. But that was the Holy Spirit, you see. I went through it. As I went through it, I now saw one line, bedpan. Okunu my yet bedpan. I did not use bedpan. No. In the 48, 50, 48 hours of labor, I was going to the toilet to wee wee and boo by myself. Everybody said she did not use bedpan. Ask me how much they charge for that bedpan. $12. How much was the problem? <laughs> How much? 2,500. Ask the next question, what is it among so many? <laughs> but I saw the $12 and I was righteously indignated. I was angry my spirit, man. What? They want to label me as a bedpan user? I did not use bedpan. Everybody said she did not use bedpan. <laughs> so I picked up my phone like the millionaire that I am, and I called the hospital management, and they came, yes, Mrs. Ene. I said, I'm actually quite shocked <laughs> at the integrity of this bill. $12 for a bed pad that I did not use. So I had this thing here. I said, ask my nurses. So, okay, excuse me, if they knew that $12, would you have solved my problem? <laughs> but I was moving with the spirit. So they took the bill and went to the manager. His name was Mr. Joseph Kennedy. I remember the faithfulness of God. Joseph Kennedy was very upset with the invoicing system of the, of the hospital. What? How, why would you do this kind of, make kind of mistake? What the, he now wrote me a personal letter 
apologizing profusely for the problem. <laughs> and gave me 50% discount. Now, so bad pan can't deliver me. There are many lessons in this story. One, we saw they see 250. We had a target, a faith target. Two, I didn't just accept what was thrown before me. Three, I danced with the Holy Spirit. Four, the favor of God came through. Exactly what we had planned for, exactly what we had. You see, God will sometimes solve your need either by raising your money to that need or bringing the thing down. If you don't pull Bake Brato Shifakali, if you don't pull the right trigger, keep speaking and shouting on that mountain. The triggers are not found in the natural realm, they are found in the spiritual realm. The church has become too carnal, too emotional, too feelings based, and we've missed the spiritual realm. But God operates in that realm. The seed principle. Second one he now did, my time is almost up, was the corresponding action principle. Make the people sit down. When he made them sit down, it was still five loaves and two fish. You don't act when you see. You act because you know and you have seen. This is where you see it. This is where you see it. You can't be blind in here. Make the people say, stop for a minute, stop for a minute, stop for a minute. Do you know that the people didn't leave? There were children there. There were mothers and fathers there. There was apparently no hope in the natural. Follow me, follow me with this. They should have wanted to feed their children. They could have said, Jesus, we'll go back down, eat and come back home. But they stayed. Why do you think they stayed? I believe they knew their problem was solved in Jesus' there. Many times the mountain just waiting for you to talk. It has packed its load, it's ready to move. Ah, Ngechi has come. Ah, my people gather your things, so she will soon drive us. Then they wait one day. Uh -uh. She's not saying anything. No. Two days. It's not Ngechi that entered the room. Yeah, she's the one. Ah, she never talks. We can, we can relax. I beg you. Like she doesn't want to send us anyway. They were there, they didn't go. Then he said, make the people sit down. And they sat down. We are not told that they began to ask, why are we sitting down? Where is the food? What is going on? If Jesus says sit down, they sat down. There was still no food. The power of corresponding action, the power of acting out what you believe before you see it. The, we have to be ready to look like mumu. Is that Mumu factor that used to stop us? Be ready to sound like Mumu, look like Mumu. Those people that laugh at you, they will laugh with you later on. Friends, there are triggers to pull. I said there are triggers to pull. There are triggers to pull. They are not logical triggers. The church has to get out of the natural realm. We are spirit. We have a soul and we live in a body. We operate in the spiritual realm. That's where the polus oculus gets dissolved. That's where the impossibilities get dissolved. Glory be to God. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. Glory be to God. Lift your hands and just worship him. I won't continue. My time is up. Give him some praise, please. Give him some praise. You've learned something this morning. Give him some praise.
give him some praise. Begin to catch yourself when you find yourself pulling logical triggers. Begin to catch yourself when you find yourself bringing out your calculator. Begin to catch yourself when you find yourself responding emotionally. Lord, it's not my fault. Lord, it's how I feel. But Lord, I've been praying about this matter. Don't, don't do that with God. He already knows what to do. He just wants you to pull the trigger. Lift your hands and give him praise. Thank him. Thank him for what you've heard. And every mountain before you, and every polus oculus, I join my faith with you today, tomorrow, tomorrow morning, and the rest of the conference. Every polus oculus that is standing before you through these seven days will be dissolved in the name of Jesus Christ. Not just by your faith, but by the corporate faith present in this place. Thank you, Lord.